On this week's episode of Very Spatial TV, I'm going to talk a little bit about interactive maps. So on this week's episode, I want to talk a little bit about interactive maps. It goes a little bit with our cartographic discussion of last week, but not exactly. Um, so here's an odd thing about interactive maps, and me, me personally. Uh, I actually have a day job. I work for the state of West Virginia. If you're a longtime listener to the podcast, you know that. And uh, I, big part of my job is I make interactive maps. But here's a really bizarre thing. I don't actually use interactive maps, like, ever, like, ever. And I was thinking to myself, why is that? Why don't I use interactive maps? And what is it about interactive maps that is something that I don't gravitate towards? And, and then when I really think about it, how often do you, as a professional or a, a person wanting to become a professional, talk about interactive maps outside of the professional realm? And I think in the general world, we just don't tend to talk about this too much. So I had some thoughts on that. Okay, first of all, let's, let's do a little bit of history about interactive maps, uh, particularly the modern interactive maps. Okay, so Wikipedia actually has a really good entry on web mapping, which is, you know, for our purposes here, basically the same thing as interactive mapping. But one of the nice things about the web mapping entry is they do have a pretty good history of web mapping section. And arguably the first real web map is, it certainly starts the birth of the World Wide Web, was the Xerox Park Map Web Viewer, which you can see the entry for it here. Uh, it is a very, very little known thing that very few people use, but is arguably the first. Interesting to know. Now there are a few sort of specific purpose web maps that were created all over the time. Uh, the Earthquake Locator, the Atlas of Canada, the Gazetteer for Scotland, all very important things. But arguably, probably the most popular, first real popular one was MapQuest. Now, MapQuest back in its day looked what we call today kind of antiquated and kludgy looking, if you will. But actually, it had a lot of great information in it. And it was sort of the go-to way of finding out how to get to places. Uh, and so as an interactive map, interactive atlas is actually what they called it, was quite powerful in its time. All right. Now, after that, for the geospatial industry, arguably one of the more important ones that came about was ArcIMS. Now, this is Let's, let's not talk about Arc I, I don't want to talk about Arc IMS. It, the, the less that's said about Arc IMS, the better. If, move on. All right. So you can see there's a lot of things that were done, and they were usually done in the sort of the expert realm for quite some time here until we get to 2005 when Google Maps is launched. Now, Google Maps in its original incarnation is not anything massively cool to look at, but you have to understand the impl implementation of its slip sliding interface, the fact that it had so much data contained in it, it was pretty much revolutionary for its time. Okay, so interactive maps have had a really long history, particularly in internet terms, 15 years is forever. Uh, but in the modern age, I think one of the challenges we have with interactive maps is they're not really addressing the types of things that we as people like to do. Okay, so let's go back to our, our Google example. And this, is, of course, is the new uh, version of Google, the more modern version. Uh, and we see what we typically see with interactive maps. We see a lot of points and lines and polygons and that sort of thing that we're very comfortable with as geospatial experts, as, as GIS people. And it communicates a lot of information in a very dense amount of space, which is great. Uh, but the problem is, I think, that, that this doesn't necessarily connect to how people live and experience their life. So let's go look at a feature that is very common in a lot of areas. It's an important part of the Morgantown area, which is the rail trail. If I search for rail trail, what I find is a lot of businesses and establishments that are along this rail trail. And these are going to give me some information, but there's actually not a lot about the rail trail itself that sort of talks about what it's like to enjoy enjoy or experience the rail trail. I can zoom into certain areas and get more details. So if I zoom into this particular area uh, where I find things like Table 9 or Rich B River Birch Cafe or the Visitor Center, it gives me some idea of the building footprints and a little bit of the, the points that are along the way, but it doesn't give me a good idea of what it's like to walk along this trail. Uh, there's not even really a good indication of what we think of geospatial stuff like elevation or how 
populated it is or you know how dense it is none of that's really contained in there now i can use some of the technologies available to us to do things like I can use Street View to get some idea of this. But you can see here in this system, there actually isn't a lot of Street View on the trail itself, which certainly makes sense because, well, it's a trail, not a street. Uh, but I can place them in certain areas to get some sort of indication of what's going on here. And this happens to be a corner lot. Uh, the street's back here. You can sort of see what it's like to stand and sort of pan around. And you get some feeling for what's going on there. Uh, but what if I wanted to see a little bit further up the rail trail and say this area? And the problem is... There's nothing there. I can't find out more information as we move up this trail, which is, you know, a little bit upsetting. I could pick this area, which gives me some insight into it in theory, but I don't really see over this precipice. And, and it's a little, you know, unfortunate that this rich in material, that's what it's like to actually live and work and move and be around this area is largely missing from these representations. And the thing is, is that if I were trying to decide where I wanted to visit in the Morgantown area along the rail trail, or if I wanted to take a job in the Morgantown area, having access to a richer understanding of the area would be much more beneficial, I think, for most people. And interactive maps, unfortunately, despite some of their powers, simply don't have the capabilities right now to represent that richness. Another thing I would say is that interactive maps have largely become sort of a mini GIS for us geospatial folks. And that's great for the people who need a GIS of some for form, but they can't afford them to the big Arc Esri suite of tools and they don't have the experience in the background. But the problem is that most people use GIS they consume it, I should say. They get the benefits from GIS, but they don't actually know anything about GIS and they don't really want to. So this balance between a full-blown web-based GIS and a thing that a lot of people to do what they need to do is a very challenging dichotomy that we're wrestling with even today. Okay, let's, let's see how this may play out in, in the real world. All right, so this is the West Virginia Flood Tool. The intent behind this tool is to communicate flood risk to people who have concern about flood risk issues within West Virginia. And that includes what we've divided into the public expert and what's called a risk map. And that's mostly for your planners to sort of understand the risk that's going on in a particular area. So we have a relatively standard interactive map that we're used to seeing. And if I zoom into a particular area, so I'm just arbitrarily picking an area, you can see here that we have a map that should indicate some degree of flood risk. It's a little hazy because you have this orange and red, but hopefully you understand that a red is bad. So if I click on the map in that area, I'm presenting with a whole lot of information on the right-hand side that helps me understand my degree of risk. But there's a lot of stuff in here. There's the FEMA flood maps, the contacts, the community information. Uh, if I clicked on an actual parcel, you could click on the parcel stuff. You get 3D flood visualizations. Lots of wealth of information. If I click on the reference layers, you can see if I start adding those then, let um, me zoom in just a little bit, but if I start adding in the reference layers and add, say, contour lines and public lands and watersheds and wetlands and uh, DOT highway routes and place names and parcels and building footprints, we get a very complicated map very quickly. And this is for the general public to understand. And it requires the general public interpret this stuff to some degree and understand what they're looking at. Now, look what happens when I click on the expert view. Okay, I click on the expert view, and suddenly we transform. We still have all that base stuff I just clicked on, but we transform the, the former sort of red zone bad into all these things, these, these different lines and hatch patterns that give us some indication of the degree of problem and how much the base flood elevation heights and all these sorts of things that require really a high degree of expert flood knowledge to interpret if you're in a particular zone or what that means, the implications. And I think that's a little tricky to expect the general public to interpret in any meaningful sense. There's so much information contained, it's very challenging. Let's even look at something simple like base maps. Look at the sheer number of base maps we have here. And there's good reasons for this. You have a lot of historical things. So I can pull up data that goes back, in this particular case, 2007. I can pull up Nate from 2011. I can sort of look at change. But it's a very powerful tool set, but it requires a very nuanced understanding of spatial data and what it's capable of and not capable of to really interpret 
well. So effectively, this flood tool, particularly when we're talking about something about the expert view or even, heaven forbid, the risk map view, it, it really is turned into sort of a mini GIS. And that's a bit of a problem, if you ask me. And let's be honest, interactive maps as a name actually are a little antiquated. It's like cyber, because one, everything is interactive everything. I have a hockey puck in the corner over there that I talk to and ask for the weather. And the second part of this is maps. I mean, we like maps. We're geospatial people. We all really love maps as a concept. But I think one of the problems is, is that we don't think about things in sort of the map realm. We, we kind of want to think about the world geospatially, which is more about location and, and space and place and movement less about the map. All right, so unsurprisingly, I don't have any solutions here. I don't have any you know, ways forward. I don't have any silver bullets to give you other than suggest that maybe some of the stuff that we think about with interactive maps, maybe we need to think about this stuff a little more broadly, I don't know, or a little deep, more deeper, but I don't know how you actually do it in a meaningful way. If I did, I would certainly be making a lot of money doing that. Okay, so there have been some attempts by companies uh, to expand interactive maps, the concepts, to include a lot of things I'm talking about, to overcome some of the things I'm talking about. Esri Story Maps is a great example of that. You're taking the power of the map and you're trying to infuse lots of the sort of qualitative, richer information on the map or into the map so that they can interact with each other. And I think it's a laudable effort. I think it's wonderful that some people are trying to push this goalpost forward. However, I think we have a lot more we can do. I think there's a lot more work that can be done in this realm. And I think that some of it is to sort of move beyond the map and think just more broadly about spatial relationships and try to figure out how do we represent that? How do we communicate it? How do we capture it? How do we present it? How do we allow people to interact with it in a meaningful way? How do we allow them to use these tool sets in their day-to-day -day lives? These things are ongoing conversations and they're not something that's going to be this product solves the problem. It's going to be a lot of different things working together and that's pretty exciting and that's pretty cool and that's sort of the original dream, if you will, of the mashup realm of interactive maps. So a lot of that's going to keep alive, but it is time, I think, to start thinking beyond the map and thinking beyond just interactivity and start thinking, how can we move this realm forward? Okay, so if you have any thoughts about interactive maps or what the future could hold for that, please leave comments down below. I would love to hear them, more comments or better, even if they're bad ones, I'm okay with that. Um, if you like the series we're doing here, please like it. If you think you'd like to see more from what we're doing, please subscribe. Uh, if you'd like to support the YouTube channel or the podcast more broadly, you can head over to veryspatial.com slash Patreon or patreon.com slash veryspatial. And you can help us uh, in the next year. We're celebrating our 15th year in the podcast and we're hoping to bring some cool stuff to you all. Uh, and we just need you know, a little help with that. Would, would not go remiss. So anyway, this is Frank uh, from Very Special TV and these are just some of my thoughts.